Good morning, Clinton family, and welcome to Beacon Forum. Again, another opportunity for our students, faculty, and staff to get an opportunity to learn and grow from our guest speakers, uh, who again, bring a diverse wealth of knowledge about their profession, their life experiences. We're excited today to have our guest speaker, Dr. Jason D. Thompson. And so again, we welcome you to Beacon Forum. Thank you for sharing your time and we look forward to a great opportunity today. Uh, right now, we're going to turn it over for our invocation to Dr. Jared Fite, our campus minister. Let us pray. To the God of all grace, we first wanna say thank you for this space that you've afforded us to gather together this day. God, we ask that right now that as we gather together, that Father, your presence will permeate uh, this space. That Father, you treat us like an instrument and play us in any key that you see necessary. And that God, the words that are shared today will be impactful, inspiring, and encouraging to us all. God bless the speaker today and allow him to speak with clarity and allow him to speak with ease. That God, you can. Uh, get the glory after all of this. Father, we love you and we thank you in advance for what you're about to do in this space. It's in the one name that reigns, rule, still has regency, but yet to return. Yeshua, our Mashiach, Jesus our Christ, our Lord, and our Redeemer. It's in Jesus' holy and righteous name we pray. Amen. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmony Of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening sky Let it resound loud as the rolling sea Sing a song of the faith that the dark past has taught us Sing a song Full of the hope that the present has brought us Facing the rising sun, sun Of a new day beacon So let us march on Till victory is won Steady feet Have not our weary feet Come to the place For which I fall aside We have come Over a way that with tears have been watered We have come Treading our path through the blood of the slaughter Bright star is cast. God of our weary, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way. Thou who has by Thy mind led us into the night, keep us forever in the path we pray. From the places of God where we met thee Bless our hearts Drunk with the wine of the world We forget thee Shadow beneath thy hand May we forever say
My name is Annika Sawyer, and today I will be introducing our guest speaker. The Reverend Dr. Jason Thompson is a proud NC native and recent resident of Harlem, New York, where he is visiting assistant professor and director of music education in New York Stanford School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. Reverend Thompson is a son of a Western, Western North Carolina annual conference where he served as a conference musician and was ordained as an instrument elder in 2002 by Bishop Vincent R. Anderson. Dr. Thompson was a pastor congregations in North Carolina, Arizona, and Kansas. But Reverend Thompson's upcoming books, Holy Shift, Navigating the Past, Future, and Movements of the Present is scheduled for 2002 release, 2022 release. In addition, he is the founder of OS fellowships and faith formations groups and the quarter of the Think Big Collaborative, a monthly forum what spotlights faith leadership and their thinking. Dr. Thompson earned undergrads and grad degrees, both music and education, including a PhD from Northern West from Northern University, Northern Northwestern University, excuse me, Northwestern University with additional studies towards the M MD in Pastoral Ministries from Boston University Schools of Theology. Jason Thompson's PhD, PhD Northern Western University is a visiting assistant professor and interim director of music education in Stanford. He believes that the core value of equity, inclusions, and belonging are essential and invisible from intellectuals and artistic excellence. This belief has been a connective thread across more than 20 years in the professions as a public school music teacher, university professor, community teaching artist, and administration for equities and inclusion. His courses and research explore socially engaged practice in the arts, music participations as a civic engagement, and the way the culture influences and mediates the music musicians' experience. Dr. Thompson's scholarly activities include the core scores published through the GIA Music and Hinshaw Music and publications in music education research, Music Educated Journal, Missouri School of Music, and Antipon. He also maintains an active schedule as a choral clinician. Currently, Dr. Thompson and two colleges are editing the books. If colors could be heard, they paint wondrous tones, intellectual books as edited collections of diverse perspectives of scholars, educators, and music makers that aims to paint a portrait of most wondrous tones of music, learning and teaching occurring across the context. Prior to New York, Dr. Thompson served the facility of Arizona State University and Appalachian University. In addition to his work in higher education, Dr. Thompson is an ordained interim elders in African Methodist Episcopal Church and has pastored con congregations in North Carolina, Arizona, and Kansas, and is currently a member of the Midwest Annual Conference and the Fifth Episcopal District. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Thompson. Good day to um, all of you who are part of this expansive Clinton College uh, community. I'm certainly very humbled by the invitation and really this opportunity to share in this Beacon Forum. Uh, I'm honored to just be at it and to join a growing list of awesome thought partners who have been previous guests with you. Uh, I do quite a bit of public speaking, both as a professor in a university setting and as ordained clergy in the AME Church. 
And I am always excited for opportunities to work in solidarity with other individuals who are doing good work, uh, even in the midst of very, very wicked problems. And I think we could all easily generate a range of problems that our society is facing, uh, that we're facing as a nation, maybe as an academic institution uh, and organizations and entities that we might be a part of. And certainly amid all of those crazy things that are happening are people in various respective places who are working very, very diligently to move the needle forward uh, through their efforts. And so I just want to say thank you for that warm introduction and to President McCorn, uh, who I actually met years ago through my good friend, George Woodruff, uh, Reverend George Woodruff. Uh, so thank you so much for your leadership here at the university. Uh, I'm also grateful for my fraternity brother, Dr. Tony McNeil, who also serves in music uh, spaces with me and also in very theological spaces with me. Uh, I'm very grateful for his uh, invitation and also his hospitality. Uh, and certainly thanks thanks to uh, Ms. Sanja Thomas uh, James, who uh, was a church member of mine back in Greensboro and now is a member of the Clinton um, family who's in, in, and others at um, Clinton College who played a role in selecting me to participate in this Beacon Forum. I'm just, I'm just elated to be here today. So I wanna talk to a specific group of people uh, today. I wanna talk to those who consider themselves dreamers, maybe visionaries. Um, perhaps you see yourself as being an entrepreneur, a, a water walker, maybe uh, a person who considers themselves a creative. I, I wanna talk to individuals who are anomalies. And I'm using that word very intentionally because it's really come up in my own uh, verbiage uh, very, very recently. To And I use that term to describe people who uh, deviate from what's considered to be the standard or maybe those who are outside of what's considered to be normal. Maybe those who have um, who, who don't quite fit in with the expectation of how uh, people believe people should operate or function within a given system. So I want to talk to that group of people today. I, I talk to them because uh, I'm considering all of you designers. Uh, and I want to use that word and, and just tuck it away in the back of your, your memory, designers. And I want to uh, adopt in this Beacon Forum the mindset of a designer. Uh, I used to be on faculty at a uh, graduate faculty member at, at Arizona State and President Crow from Arizona State reminds us that that we are designers, uh, not managers, not operators, not bureaucrats, but designers. I mean, this is a design meeting. This is a design session. I know we're virtually today, but but, but let's think of this that uh, as, as though we are in or at a design table. Uh, Crow argues that it takes thinkers of every type, I mean, to design education that impacts society in ways that achieve the goals that we champion as important. And so I spent a lot of time uh, in my own professional work helping institutions and helping organizations to get under the hood <clears throat> with their espoused values. That is what we say we believe. Uh, and also their enacted practices. That is what they actually do. So you have uh, in many cases, uh, many opportunities, a lot of evidence that that what institutions say they believe and what they do is is rather expansive. Right. And so I've observed this mismatch in academic programs and universities. I've seen it in churches. I've seen it in fraternal institutions, in community organizations. And the list goes on and on. And I imagine that you are already thinking of examples in your own life where you see this sort of disconnect, this divide between what we say we believe about, uh, about our institutions and what actually happens in actual practices. And I think paying attention, particular attention to that relationship between uh, what we do in education and how that reflects a particular value system is of prime importance, particularly to uh, this beacon forum as we sort of grapple with, as we think through as, as thought leaders, thought partners about the aims of education, right? Uh, and I say this is of prime importance. Why? Because education is a product of design. And I just want to throw that out at, you know, at, at the onset, uh, that we design the outcomes that we get in education are really products of how we design them. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Sarah Ahmed. I've just really enjoyed um, Sarah's work. And she says institutions, including universities, function to maintain themselves uh, and are exclusive by design, right? And she goes on to say that institutions function as usual, 
which makes it difficult to see their inner workings. And I've been a part of, of, of universities now since 2000. Uh, I think it was 2006 when I became a lecturer at Arizona at Appalachian State University. And, and it, even since that moment uh, of, of coming into higher ed, uh, it's interesting that I began to see how universities function as usual and the inner workings that are happening that I didn't see at the beginning that I see more clearly now, even as an administrator. So this, this problematic hidden in plain sight system only becomes visible when someone troubles the institution. Uh, and, and so that's interesting because usually that someone is always students, right? Uh, maybe it may be a disgruntled faculty member. Uh, uh, I think about this because the response of the university to students reveals what the institution prioritizes. Uh, particularly, it, it, it reveals how a, an institution functions, most often as intended or often as designed or often as decided. And so recently, I had listened to uh, Linda Lutton's podcast called The View from Room 205. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's, it's really informative. Um, that podcast gives listeners this entry into the learning that's occurring in a fourth grade classroom at the William Penn Elementary School in Chicago's North Lawndale neighborhood. Uh, during the episode I listened to, Linda made an interesting assertion about the ineffectiveness of school design. Uh, she says that, quote, the idea that students should have an equal chance to get ahead, no matter where they're from, no matter what their neighborhood that they call home, is at the heart of our country's identity. It's why public schools were created. Uh, they're the great equalizer except too often they are not, end quote. You know, and I, and I scratch my head there grappling with this notion that schools are not or may not um, uh, adequately be an equalizer for the conditions of humanity. Uh, I was a student in, in K through 12 uh, schooling myself. And then I, you know, uh, uh, the beginning of this academic year actually marks year number 23 in the profession. I can't believe it's been 23 years since I became uh, an educator and now entering into my third year as an administrator where I'm tasked with this, this uh, task to think about what the purposes of a music teacher education program might be. And so all of that's at the backdrop. Uh, of my mind that the same notion of equalizing or being equitable or um, thinking about how we meet the needs of our populations uh, is found in music teacher education programs where at the university level, uh, we're still grappling with, with questions about whose music gets to be represented in curricula. Um, is, is it just Beethoven, Bach, and Brahms, or can we allow Nas, for example, or, or Common, or can we allow uh, other representations and other genres to be represented uh, at the table, right? Uh, we're grappling with uh, teaching strategies and how those sh should be employed. Uh, I think, for example, um, how teachers, you know, the question that I'm asking myself now and asking of the teachers who work in my program, the, um, the professors who instructors who work in the program, or, or it, it, it is whether uh, teachers should be solely responsible for providing instruction or can professors themselves empower and encourage students to offer thoughtful and thorough contributions to the learning environment because student voice matters. Think about that for a moment, that what, you know, what would happen if the learners become the co-contributors to the educational space, right? I mean, yes, they're students, but they're also thinkers. At the same time, they're also teachers at sometimes themselves. Uh, I always make this joke when I start each um, semester with students that, that I don't see my role as an instructor to sort of saw off the top of your heads and pour all of this 23 years of knowledge into to you, but that I know students show up in our classrooms very knowledgeable, very aware, uh, very experienced in, in many ways. And how can um, we grapple with how we allow students to show up and be a part of co-shaping, co-contributing to that, that educational space? At the same time, my profession is still so, um, thinking about how we might diversify our student population, how we might diversify our faculty populations. I mean, many places we don't see, right, uh, faculty and student populations that, that show the cross section of society. And so the list just goes on and on and on. And, and I'm highlighting just a few specific uh, issues that are germane to my profession of music teacher education. But and whatever profession or life path you have chosen or you're choosing, I'm talking to students for just a moment, uh, I'm just reminding all of us that there will be issues that confront you, right? 
So I'm talking about music teacher education. Maybe it might be for you, biology. Maybe it might be sci um, that by computer science. It could be education, whatever you're in, right? Maybe it's theology, it's religion. Um, uh, maybe it's political science. There will always be issues that <laughs> confront you. There will be problems with which you will have to grapple. And I say that now in my third you know, year as, a, as an administrator, realizing that problems don't often come with easy solutions, with, with ready-made answers or, or answers that, that, that are easy transferable across context that what worked in one space does not always work in another space. And, and so this is why, uh, as you're thinking uh, today, I, I'm encouraging all of us to develop a designer mindset, right? You know, when I talk about a, a designer mindset, I immediately recall episodes of Project Runway. And I'm not sure if you are familiar with the American re reality uh, television series that focuses on fashion design. Uh, the contestants compete with each other to create the best clothes, or and, and, and they are restricted by time, by materials, by by themes. Uh, if you recall, in one challenge called Fashion Headliners, outfits were to be made out of newspaper, right? So you can you know, imagine what that was like to to, to use very delicate um, de delicate material to, in order to make a, a usable fabric or usable attire. In another challenge called Fashion That Drives You, the designers were asked to make their outfits out of unconventional materials that would um, be more likely, uh, that you'd find more likely uh, in an auto shop or auto repair shop or even at a car factory. I mean, think about this for a moment, you know, using car seat covers for fabric or metal accents or woven seat belts. I mean, who knew that a Saturn hybrid could yield so many pieces of fashion before the rest headed to the junkyard, right? And so uh, I'm thinking about design in that way, right? The way we construct um, uh, objects and materials for our use. At the same time, um, uh, as a music reference, uh, I was struck by a comment in uh, Jay-Z's 2010 book, Decoded, where uh, sampling was a design technique, right? Um, that he and his peers used to create and reconstruct the world in which they lived, he stated, listen to this, that we were kids without fathers. So we found our fathers on wax. And that's you know music records that were originally wax cylinders. And on the streets and in history, and in a way, that was a gift that we got to pick and choose the ancestors uh, who would inspire the world we are going to make for ourselves. Uh, our fathers were gone, usually because they just bounced, but we took their old records and used them to build something fresh, uh, and, and, end quote. So I'm, 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 I'm struck by that uh, notion of using old things to create something, how to cre create something new. How do we see maybe new patterns developing even in old curricular uh, or old modular designs? And so, you know, Project Runway with Fashion, Jay-Z and Sampling, I am just reminding all of us that we are designers, right? So think about that for a moment. A designer is a person who, based on a particular vision, and I want you just to put that uh, front and center, the idea of vision, um, who, who, based on a particular vision, a designer plans the form, maybe the structure or something, here it is, before it's made. And I've got to say that again. I want to highlight that a, a designer, using a particular vision, based on a particular vision, plans the form, plans the function of something before it's made, right? So let me ask this question now. What's your vision? Mm -hmm. This is a question that I ask my students. It's a question that I ask our teachers. It's a question I ask churches. What's your vision, right? Um, I remember one time, uh, President McCorn, where I was at a church doing a, 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 a workshop, and uh, the question that I asked the, the attendees was, what, what, what's the vision of this particular ministry at this congregation? What's, what's, what's the vision? What's driving you? And when I went around, it was interesting that everybody had a very different idea of what the vision was, which goes to prove to you that often we, we have very different ways of thinking about what uh, a vision might be and how can we think about a common vision that guides the work that we do. So what's your, what's your vision, right? Uh, and, and allow me to make a distinction really quickly between vision and sight, okay? <laughs> I feel like this is the, like the, the preacher coming out of me for just a moment, that the difficulty that so many people have is that, that they only have the powers of observation, right? The powers of observation allow us to see a, a situation as it currently exists, right? Um, that we're able to describe a situation, 
um, you're able to diagnose a matter, a situation. Um, but I want to remind all of us that description or diagnosis does not necessarily yield viable solutions, right? And I'm saying this as an administrator who, who is, is, is continually helping people to move beyond just um, um, identifying what the issues are. But can we move from diagnosis, move from description to very viable solutions to, to the problems that we can easily see? So we need designers, but we need designers with actual vision, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to students who are in programs. I'm talking to program leaders. I'm talking to professors. I'm talking to staff members, right? But that we need vision. You know, the, the beautiful thing about the work that, that you're doing now is that your core values of scholarship or social change or spirituality, uh, servant leadership are a type of vision, right? How we get there is always very more, is, is, is more nuanced. But, but, but vision is what allows you to see not just what's apparent, but also to see what's not obvious and therefore to see what's possible. Uh, I think I want to repeat that again, just for emphasis, that vision is what allows you to see not just what is apparent, but also to see what is not obvious, right? And therefore to see what is possible. I'm just going to go back and draw on that uh, project runway uh, um, idea that I keep thinking about how sometimes you have uh, these these materials that don't seem like they would go together or you would normally not necessarily see them as 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 Jay-Z did right as a way to bring you know these objects together to create something new something fresh but 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 vision is not is what allows you to see not just what's apparent but also what is not obvious and therefore to see what is possible so it, you know in my new role as this uh, this the director of music education at NYU I am challenged now to think of what I do uh, as a product of design, right? Uh, to, to, to have a design mindset that has a vision, not for what I can see, <laughs> but, but but what is actually possible uh, that I may not see um, readily. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm thinking about these outcomes against this backdrop of a world where, where music is rather expansive. I mean, here I am, I live in Harlem, New York, and as I walk around my neighborhood, uh, music is happening everywhere. When I take the train down uh, to the village where my office is, and I walk through Washington Square Park, it's wonderful to see people who are who are playing instruments in many ways and being creative and doing street mime and doing bucket drumming. All of these things are happening, right? So, so I keep thinking about how music as it exists outside of the institution, it's just rather expansive. I mean, it, it's comprehensive. Uh, there are composers. There are people who are teaching artists in a range of genres. There are entrepreneurs who are opening music businesses or creating music apps. There are music critics who are talking about music uh, making and music products in very uh, thoughtful ways. There are arrangers, beat makers. There are performers. There are academicians. There are administrators and so much more. And so I say that because when I look at music programs, right, uh, in comparison to what's happening in, 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 in greater society, often music programs are divorced from or even devoid of the multiple ways to be musical that exist in the world. And so that, that seems problematic to me that that so much of the work that we do in the world to ensure music. And many of you probably grew up listening to music and I'm music lovers and music aficionados now that that to come to a university and realize that that may not be represented is is really troubling for me. It's troubling for me. Uh, as, as an individual, it's troubling for me as uh, a person who works in this area to think that somebody could be excluded. Somebody's music practices and, and preferences might be excluded from music that is worth uh, meaningful study at the at this at this um, college level. And 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 to add to that, um, so much of what we do is primarily performance. So it's not necessarily composing. It's not necessarily being creative. It's not necessarily about making apps or or doing things that could push the boundaries of the many ways to be musical. It's about performing, performing in a choir, performing in um, a band, performing in uh, an orchestra and those kind of things. And so uh, I, I say that because I want to push the envelope for just a moment to say that we are preparing students and, and I'm, I'm, I'm erasing uh, music for just a moment, putting it on the shelf. But for whatever you do, we're pre preparing students to go into a very 
uh, a changing world, an evolving world, an interconnected world now. And even in my profession, uh, require music teacher candidates who are flexible enough to teach choir, but also to teach a, a section of digital music making is <laughs> it's, 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 it's challenging, right? Or to have students to teach instrument, um, instrumental music like band or orchestra, but also a course on music criticism or a course on music appreciation can be challenged, challenging because our programs don't necessarily prepare um, students for that type of fluidity, that type of, of, of flexibility, right? Uh, and so I, I've been thinking about that in my work. I share that with you because there are a couple of design aspirations that I think have been very helpful for me. And I'm just gonna share them with you that come out of this uh, new American university concept. I'm just gonna give you a few of them, but they've been in the back of my mind as I have to make very important decisions about curriculum, make uh, important decisions about budgeting, right? Like how we spend our money. One of the first design aspirations is thinking about how we leverage our place, right? In other words, what makes New York City and NYU as expensive as it is, right? This vibrant ec musical ecology to, to enact and, 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 um, and to work and be, um, uh, to study music teaching and learning in that place, right? Using that same uh, design principle of leveraging our place, I ask you, right, what, what can you get? What do you get from a Clinton College experience that you could not get anywhere else, right? I think those are the kind of ideas that we've got to grapple with, right, as a design principle. How do we leverage our place in a way that people, uh, despite all of the circumstances and nuances, the, 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 the problems that we face in our particular context, here are the reasons why coming here, studying here, being a part of this community in some way is a place that you will you will get things that you cannot get uh, other places. Uh, another thing is, is another design aspect is, is enabling student success. I, this is one that's very meaningful for, for me because I think we have to recognize that student success, right, may look different with each student. Um, and, and that's hard because when we think about giving students all the same, we realize that not, that, that, that not everybody needs the same uh, thing in order to be, be, be successful. And, and how do we qualify what success should even look like, right? I'm encouraging our faculty for one example, as we go into the, the, the new uh, academic year, to explore more ways uh, to give final assessments beyond uh, writing a paper, beyond giving a final presentation. What are multiple and nuanced ways that we can account for student success that also show the student's best work. And I don't know that a paper written the night before is, is really a, a good way to gauge success, right? And many, there are many of these. And because of time, I won't go into them. Like how do we transform society is another design aspiration. By that, I mean catalyze social change uh, by the ways that we connect the work of our university to the actual needs that are around us, right? So whether you're in Rock Hill or you're in New York or wherever you are, there are these wonderful needs that I believe our institutions may have uh, 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 answers or could work in solidarity with people in communities to solve those particular issues. We can transform society by that kind of design principles that we think about our curriculum, we think about our scope and sequence of what students go through as they matriculate through the university to ultimately, as a design principle, transform society. I think that's powerful, right? Or to be another design principle, uh, to be socially embedded. Uh, you know, we can't transform uh, societies in isolation, but, but, but we can connect with communities through mutually beneficial partnerships. And I imagine that uh, Dr. McCorn, uh, President McCorn, you're already thinking about partnerships and, and, and the evidence is working that, that, that we have some mutually beneficial partnerships that could really uh, worked for the university as well as for stakeholders. All right, so I'm going to just push us forward because I, I, I want to, to just answer the question, well, what would that mean then, right? I believe that that means that our path forward requires designers that use story, S-T-O-R-Y, as a type of truth telling. How do you use story, individual stories, as a, a, a type of truth telling, not only to where we have been, but where we're saying we're trying to go, and maybe even where we are right now uh, as we try to grapple with and, and, and think through uh, some of the current issues that we have, right? Uh, in her PhD dissertation, Dr. Mallory Alekna, who was a formal, former doctoral student of mine at Arizona State, centered the voices of underrepresented music students to learn 
from them about the complex ways they experience equity or inequity within their music school. I mean, she argued for this importance of storytelling, which is, a you know, of course, an African-American concept, right? It comes from what we do. Uh, so this idea of storytelling as a way for us to consider our places or consider our communities, our institutions, asking, here it is, y'all, in this space, who is being welcomed to share their story? Who's being welcomed to share their knowledge? Who's being welcomed to share their life? Equally, who is not? And, and, and I think by allowing for storytelling, we can prioritize people over the systems that, and the happenings of an institution, right? Going back to Sarah Ahmed about how you come up against an institution, the, its inner workings. But I think if we, if we allow for stories to emerge, we prioritize people over systems of the institution, which really initiates the opportunity to create more equitable spaces, systems, institutions, practices, and the list goes on and on. So, so, so here it is that everybody loves a good story, right? Stories create their own bonds. They represent cohesion, shared understandings, meanings. I mean, stories enliven our understanding of complex issues and introduce new perspectives into our worldview. Uh, but at the same time, there are potentially multiple, often contradictory stories and counter realities that provide solidarity for storytellers tellers, and for listeners, this impetus to change. And I want to conclude my talk today with my own story. Uh, it's a story of uh, identity, a story of recognition, a story of involvement, maybe a story of my own experience of being what I would consider being othered, even in music education, right? Because I come to a place where my my my, my musical experiences uh, uh, were in church uh, and coming to an institution where uh, that was not necessarily um, um, uh, evident or encouraged, right? And so I want to just, uh, just as a, a quick roadmap, I'm focusing on three ideas, visibility, existence, and essence, right? Ex visibility, existence, and essence. And so I'm going to read this quickly. Uh, it's called The Gospel of Musical Inclusion. The Gospel of Musical Inclusion. As a child, what I loved most about the Methodist church that my family and I attended in our small North Carolina town was the delicious Sunday buffet. Not a buffet of yams or roast or peach cobbler, although they were delicious as well. No, no, they're, they're, this was a buffet of musical offerings, traditional hymns, served up with a heaping side of soul-stirring spirituals and gospel tunes, basted in a rich marinade of Holy Spirit, all of which poured out of the diaphragms of these robust mocha-skinned women and their burly male counters. Choirs of 10, 20, and sometimes the entire congregation lifted their voices harmoniously and, more often than not, shook the rafters and touched my soul. These gifts filled our musical appetites, and yes, our cup did runneth over. All that partook left well-fed, including Grandma Mary, who preferred hymns, Pop, who had a particular affinity for men's quartet singing, and me with my love for gospel music. You know, with such a rich variety of musical customs and practices, it is no wonder why I found our services so fascinating. But that variety was not just limited to my church. For instance, my high school choral director programmed a range of repertoire choices, such as Western classical music, spirituals, gospel, popular music, musical theater, uh, as a way to ensure comprehensiveness in our music studies. The breadth and of cross-cultural musical experiences that I encountered through church and school was quite remarkable. I mean, I absolutely love this extensiveness and identified in and through those musical experiences in multiple ways. But music study at the collegiate level was a steep departure from those rich and varied experiences I previously knew. In both explicit and inferred ways, I quickly learned that some genres and ways of being musical were considered unworthy of meaningful study at the, at the tertiary level. Yet they still are. And despite the carefully crafted diversity statements and the glossy photos intended to capture a commitment to inclusion, many institutions engage in a splitting process that places symbolic boundaries or, of closure around what music gets to count in the curriculum to the exclusion of what does not count. You know, excluding people 
things and ideas. It's just the norm. Arbitrary gatekeepers and music institutions sit at the entryways to all that is grand and good and decide who and what is qualified and worthy to pass through. These deciders determine what is good music and what is not good music, as well as who should speak and who should not. Through these distinctions, gatekeepers discount that which is deemed unworthy, whether people or experiences or music, as if these representations have less merit or less value to teach the musical minds of the world. They exclude others as if that knowledge should stay within the group that appreciates it, and only that which is worthy should be taught to our masses. But, 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 but compartmentalizing human knowledge and endeavor is never constructive. Yet institutions do it all the time. I mean, gospel music itself is often approached as if it has nothing of value except for those who sit on wooden, um, broken wooden pews. Uh, thus, it is not worth our time, much less our budget. But if carbon and hydrogen and oxygen each had their own budget and never got together, life on our planet would cease to exist. But you know, it's no different with music. We must ensure that the musical experience is full and conscious and an active participation for all, powerful and powerless, newcomer and lifelong aficionado, young and veteran, culturally apparent and ambiguous, because without it, an integral part of the musical experience will cease to exist. As it is with air, it is with music, as it is with life. How do I know that this compartmentalizing is happening? Because I've seen it. You know, in his 1984 interview with writer and academician Julius Lester, James Baldwin, the American novelist, playwright, and activist stated unequivocally that, quote, perhaps I did not succumb to ideology, as you put it, because I have never seen myself as a spokesperson. I'm a witness. In the church in which I was raised, you were supposed to bear witness to the truth. Now, later on, you wonder what in the world the truth is, but you do know what a lie is, end quote. And like my brother James, I am a witness today. I have seen what is essential and what is timeless, what is dated and what is in need of discarding and maybe what is must be created that is necessary. As a witness, let me share my testimony. To the witness, do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this chapter, uh, in this moment is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Witness, I do, so help me God. I have heard countless professors espouse the value of inclusion and its enacted practices while rigidly maintaining a distinction between theirs and ours. <laughs> and I, I, as I've journeyed through college to graduation to a professor, that chasm never closed. I do not think it egotistical to call myself an authority on these matters by virtue of my education or my skills, my experiences, maybe even my own racial and gender embodiment. I am a character witness to the moral conduct and good reputation of countless peers whose voices too often are scrutinized, policed, rendered to the margins by the veneer of good intentions and passive aggressive curiosities. You might be surprised at the list of individuals who identify with my descriptions. You know them even if you don't know that they struggle and they are plentiful. They are the dreamers, the visionaries, the entrepreneurs, the creatives. They are the anomalies whose spirits walk on water and they join me in this witness. And what do we um, bear witness to in this lack of um, inclus inclusion and uh, its painful impact? Our struggles with the notions of visibility, existence and essence. We feel invisible when we are not seen, whether through our music, our love, our passions. This invisibility uh, is not new to racial bodies who are rarely seen beyond their visible culture or knowledge as being legitimate without comparison to some dominant norm. Similarly, questions about the merits of studying gospel, rock or genre beyond classical music miss the ultimate point about the music experience. And that is that studying all music is essential in gaining a more complete portrait of what it really means to be musical. I often think of this ill-constructed comparison akin to a shop owner viewing those who enter the store as potential patrons 
um, or, or, or as potential thieves. And yet that comparison is part of the experience for bodies like me in music institutions. I'm going to stop there because this goes on, but you see where I'm going. Uh, I want to just read just the very last part here as I bring this time with you to a close that says, I am in alignment with Chicago artist and trained architect Amanda Williams's view that what we value is reflected in what each of us chooses to pay attention to, to care for, and to sustain. For me, this need for visibility, existence, and essence, those two parts I did not cover in this um, session, is more than a professional endeavor. It is a personal goal. That is a clarion call to ensure that other witnesses, students, uh, uh, faculty or staff who are at the margins have a chance to tell their story and to have that story count. It's a call to help guarantee that what the most privileged and resourced are able to provide their own is the new standard for what is made available to all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Thompson. Uh, thank you for inviting us to the design table today. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was a brilliant way that you laid it out. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes for a Q&A, and I want to ask people if you have a burning question, if you would uh, type that in the comment section so that we can try to get to it. I won't promise that we'll get to that, but this presentation has been so rich, and we want to thank you. We're probably going to have to invite you back, Dr. Thompson, so you can engage with our students uh, some more. Um, I, I want to uh, kind of frame my question by talking about our sojourn at Clinton College, because what we have become is in many ways the result of design thinking. I couldn't help but thinking about design thinking while you were talking, which is related to, to empathy, right? And I heard a lot of what you said is, is um, being sensitive to the individual gifts and talents that people bring, even if it's undeveloped, whatever they bring to the table. And part of our role in higher education is to develop those gifts. So for our students, for instance, I'd like you to um, um, speak a little bit, if you can, about the role that music has played. And I wanna put in brackets that I see music, using your words, as storytelling. Yeah. Right. So music in many ways is is telling a story. And Jay-Z is one of our most gifted storytellers uh, of this generation. What do you what what role do you see that playing in our past um, attempts at liberation, agency, vocation and what it could play in our future role? Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, I could answer this in so many different ways, but I just keep thinking about how music has been one connective thread um of our past our present and really where we're going uh i think about how music has been used in social movements like the black power movement or civil rights and how it in some ways can mobilize people to action in ways that others don't i, I always joke with my preacher friends that sometimes people don't come to church to hear you they will come to hear the music it, it has a way of, of 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 speaking to our spirit speaking to our hearts uh, and in and, 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 uh, ways that that other things don't. Um, here's what 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 I have noticed though that 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 we don't have a lack of people to speak through music, but I'm always concerned by what they say, mm. and I don't mean to, to say that as a censorship. I often think that there's a cacophony of voices that are mm. always playing in our mind. Uh, I think about. Um, just as a generational divide, when I was working on uh, my dissertation at the um, uh, the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center, which is a, a, a Chicago public school housed within uh, a the, the Cook County Juvenile Deten um, Detention Center, I realized that that the kind of music that I listened to, right, as a as a, an older person from the South, was very very different. The kind of music I listened to was very different than. Than the music that, that 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 those young men who were detained in that facility listened to, they listened to Chief Keith and Waka Flock and Gucci Mane, and I didn't know any of those things. But what I recognize is that 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 the perspectives of those particular uh, artists uh, didn't necessarily resonate with me. And what I think we have to do is begin to give people not to say, "Here's what you should listen to," "Here's how you should use music," but to think about what the purpose, what the aims of that music should be to push us to where the next generation must go. Uh, and I think that's hard, that's challenging. 
uh, because music uh, can, can, can certainly be very enticing, but it also comes with it a responsibility, right? To then use music in ways that help the masses to connect and to stay and to, to, to make us better people. And I, I could keep going on and on, but I just yeah. keep thinking that, that, what, that what we have to do in this moment is to push away the cacophony of sound and say, who's, whose voice is speaking uh, in a way that pushes us to the next level? Yeah, that's so important. I mean, I think you also made a very persuasive case for why music still needs to be a part of the yeah. curriculum and not an appendage, not an afterthought, but a way right. that's fully integrated. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we, you know, we're we're biased, but we think a, a good liberal arts education still has great value. Yes. And there are people that don't think that. So we have to keep pushing that. But thank you for that. We do have one question in the chat, DK, if you could put that question up. Uh, that I could pose to Dr. Thompson, um, how you turn every situation into a designer mindset. How do you get started and how do you see yourself finishing the steps to finish? Yeah. You know, I, I think about how that old adage that says, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's what part of it is, is to to identify where the where you start, you know, uh, sometimes and I've learned in my own sort of personal journey that going the hardest part about going to the gym is going to the gym. You know? and, and, and if you can if you can just get started often, I say this to my own students, because sometimes they, they the work that they have to do seems so insurmountable. They have more more work to do than the month left to get it done uh, that I think, well, you got to start somewhere. And how do you um, how do you just get started? Um, and I think the other part, too, is that I, I still go, I was raised by my mother who could could um, somehow take two eggs or three eggs and mix uh, milk with it. Or she would take it. You know, she just knew how to how to, 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 to cook enough food for Sunday that it didn't matter who came by. Everybody got fed and then there were leftovers. I still don't understand that. But I think that's part of it is to say, how do we um, do, do we create something? that's going to be sustaining and nourishing. And, and, and part of that is just getting started because once you get started, I think you're able then to see what the components are. Um, and and I, I wouldn't be so, um, so um, um, uh, what's the word, ahead of myself to try to do it all at one setting. I just would, 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 would take small steps. Uh, again, that analogy has worked for me that the hardest part of going to the gym is just going yes, to the sir. gym. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's it. I'm with you. Well, this was rich. Thank you so much. And again, uh, we hope to have you back. As I tell every one of our guest speakers, uh, you're now part of the Clinton family. So awesome. we claim you and you have a standing invitation uh, to come back and be with us. And we hope to invite you to the campus of uh, in person so you can share with us. Uh, once again, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for uh, for blessing us so, so richly today. We want you to hang on, uh, beloved. We do have a couple of announcements uh, to make before you go. Um, at this time, I'm going to go to either Dr. Morgan or Dr. Brown for our yes, Dr. Brown. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thompson, for those wonderful words of wisdom. Thank you, Prez, as always, for your participation and guidance. Real quick, I want to turn it over to Ms. Bettina Wilson. She is going to be the director and leader of our new Clinton College Gospel Choir. So I don't want to take any more time. We're excited to hear from Ms. Wilson. Hello, everybody. Greetings to Dr. McCorn and the Clinton College family. Mm -hmm. I am extremely excited about this opportunity. I am excited about what's in store for the Clinton College Gospel Choir. My name again is Bettina Wilson, and I have been directing choirs for 24 years, and I've also been serving in the music ministry Um I would like to say as long as uh, my mama made me, but I will say uh, it's been 25 plus years and I am just really excited about meeting everyone. I do want to invite you to our interest meeting tomorrow. This is Thursday, uh, tomorrow, uh, August 25th at seven o'clock in the multi-purpose room so that you can learn more about me and I can learn more about you. I do want to let you know there is money on the table and I have a bright personality, God, so I do have the tendency to joke a lot, but in all seriousness, I know how to be serious and I know how to get down to business and ministry means everything to me. My goal with the Clinton Gospel Choir, we are going to... Uh, 
we are going to impact, we're going to engage, we're going to um, empower, and we're going to be excellent without excuse. I am so excited to meet you all. So please meet me tomorrow, Thursday, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. in the multi-purpose room. And you all are welcome to come and sing. Uh, scholarships are available. I will give more information about that um, in the interest meeting on tomorrow as well. I do want to go ahead and announce that our first performance will be Wednesday, September 14th at 11 a.m. in the Clinton College Gymnasium. So I want everybody to plan to be there. I want you to plan and support the gospel choir and we are looking forward to what's ahead. My goal for the Clinton Choir um, is to bring inspiration to first uh, the Clinton College family, then the community, and I'll go as far as saying the region and the nation, uh, faculty and staff, you are welcome to join the choir. Students, please come and join the choir. We're going to roar with a powerful sound. So I'm excited to meet you all again. Thank you, President McCorn, for this opportunity. Dr. Brown, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow night. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Tammy Hayes, the Associate Dean of Work Program and Career Services, for those of you whom I haven't met. Um, just want to just a couple of things I wanted to mention. Everyone should have received an um, email, actually a couple of emails regarding our upcoming career fair that's going to take place on campus in the library um, on September 8th from 1 to 4. So um, I'm really excited about this, this event because it is it will be the first um, career fair on campus in I think quite a while. And at least since I've been you know, here at Clinton College. So really wanted to get out the word about that uh, because we really wanna ha try to have a good showing um, of students for the, the career fair since it is the first one. Um, and it does really make a difference in the turnout as far as like working with employers and employers wanting to come back and partner with us and work with us on uh, different events. So um, just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. And also we have planned um, for an employer to come out on August 30th from seven to eight. And this will be a presentation uh, or workshop on career fair prep preparation, um, because it's really important um, for you all to, for the students to come to the career fair prepared. You know, you wouldn't just show up. Uh, you definitely want to be prepared. And there are some things that you need to do to prepare for that event um, for, for the career fair. So we're going to have an employer come out on August 30th, which is next Tuesday from seven to eight, and that will also be in the library and the employer will be presenting, giving some information about career fair preparation. So um, that's all I have on my end that I wanted to share with you. You know, we got these two events um, upcoming in the next couple of weeks. And so we really, again, we really want you to be a part of these events and to show up and, you know, for Clinton College and make us look good, you know, so we can continue to have these type of events. And so um, I will be sending out, I will continue to send out emails about these events as the reminder. If you have any questions, you know, just feel free to, to email me and I'll be happy to address any questions that, you know, that you may have. And we hope to see you there. We hope to see you at, at the events. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Brown. Yeah. <laughs>